Uh, yeah, well, once again, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, this is the first of two sessions today uh, to mark uh, Transport Planning Day, uh, which is the uh, festival of transport planning that's uh, hosted and organised by the Transport Planning Society. Uh, my name is Mark Frost and I'm the current chair of the Transport Planning Society and I will be chairing uh, the two sessions today. Uh, so thank you again for joining us and thank you all to our panellists as well for, for giving up your time. Um, so for those of you that don't know us, we're the Transport Planning Society and we're the professional body for transport planners in the UK and Ireland. We exist to facilitate, develop and promote best practice in transport planning and provide a focus for dialogue between all those engaged in it, whatever their background or otherwise or other professional affiliation. So we are a genuine home for transport planners. We're not planners. We're not engineers. Uh, we are uh, transport planners. We sit somewhere between the two. Um, the event today is a culmination of our Transport Planning Day campaign, which we've been running since 2008 to celebrate transport planning and indeed help shape its future. And the theme for this year's campaign was equality, diversity and inclusion, um, often abbreviated to ED and I. We chose this as our theme because we believe good transport planning unlocks horizons, but not everyone has equal access to transport. Um, a fact that has been long recognised, but is as true potentially today as it has been for, for uh, many, many years. Uh, pandemic has shone a light on profound inequalities in our communities. Now more than ever, the transport planning profession needs to help build and, and design a more inclusive society and one that accounts for the diverse need of the people that use it. Um, so far, our campaign has been a great success. We've had eight very uh, varied events leading up to and including today, covering uh, subjects as diverse as best practice and equalities impact assessment to new advances in assisted technology. Uh, through a, for a full and very frank debate around the tensions that sometimes exist between accessibility and inclusion and sustainability, which is particularly topical at the moment. Uh, we've engaged over 1,500 people in July since these events, and we've also complemented those with uh, 13 original pieces of um, writing, blogs by our TPS board members and friends of TPS. Uh, and what's particularly uh, heartening from my perspective, as well as TPS's own efforts, it's great to see that Transport Planning Day has very much been adopted um, as a, a day of celebration uh, across the sector. And we've had a, a large number of private consultancies and public sector agencies that are also uh, running events to celebrate uh, TPS. So in this event this afternoon, we'll explore how transport planners can uh, address EDNI within the profession, off offering examples, recommendations and case studies of best practice. But before I introduce, I guess I'd like to introduce our, I'd like to encourage our attendees to put any questions I have for the panelists in the in the chat. Uh, and we'll be dedicating some time at the end of the Q&A to endeavour as many, answer as many of those as, as possible. Uh, we'd also welcome uh, those who are social, social media literate to uh, live tweets or engage on uh, LinkedIn um, through the through the event using the, uh, the hashtag hashtag TP day 2021. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts as we go through through the session on that. Um, I think some of you may be expecting uh, Lord Blunkett, David Blunkett on this session. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Lord Blunkett, such is the, the, the fickle nature of those uh, those uh, parliamentarians who, who exist in our legislature, have been called away on some urgent business this afternoon. So it's unfortunately una unable to join us. Um, but we hope that he will be engaging with some TPS events in the, in the near future. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote spe speakers for this session. Um, we have Rachel Billington, Head of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion at ACOM, who is our platinum sponsor uh, for TP Day, uh, and joined by her colleague Neil MacDonald, who's a Transport Planner and Regional Director at ACOM. Uh, and also speaking in this session, we have Nuna Kwashi, an Associate and EDI Lead at Arup, who is one of our gold sponsors. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Rachel and Neil for their keynote address, discussing recommendations of the EDI Roundtable, TPS and ACOM organised earlier in this year. Rachel, Neil, over to you. Thank you very much. And just uh, welcome, everybody. Just as I'm about to come live, some of my tech has just died. So I just wonder if Neil could, we did plan this earlier, just in case. Is it possible you could bring up the slides? I think it might be one of those sessions. Anyway, moving on. Uh, thank you so much um, for letting me come to speak to you today. And Neil, really appreciate um, the opportunity to do that. Um, and happy Transport Planning Day. And it's my first Transport Planning Day that I've been involved in um, because um, I'm actually brand new to this industry. Uh, I started with ACOM in um, uh, five months ago now. And previously my background has been in policing and uh, in a variety of different roles in HR roles. But in particular, um, my final role was um, the role of EG&I lead at the Metropolitan Police Service, which as you can imagine, was an absolutely fantastic role for me to do personally. And I've seen the absolutely very best of ADNI. And as you can imagine, I've seen some of the challenges there as well. 
So um, we had um, a, a really good session that I was able to bring some of that insight into. Um, and I just wonder, um, just uh, Neil, um, I think we might be showing the notes again on that one. So um, it, are you able to just show it uh, from a normal view and that'd be quite helpful. This is what happens in, in virtual uh, pieces. I'll carry on whilst we, we try and sort that one out. Thank you for that, Neil. So uh, I, I'm Rachel, as I said, you'll be joined by Neil shortly, who um, the, uh, what we're hoping to be able to do is give you a really good blend of uh, both eg and I insight, but also operational insight as well. I think that's really important that we make sure that we're able to apply whatever we want to do uh, with eg and I as well. Um, and as we move on, I think I'll just talk a little bit about the aims of the session. The aims of the session were that on, on the back of, I think Mark spoke to you before about some of the inputs you've already done throughout this year. We held this round table in, in September. We were delighted to host, obviously, our Transport Planning Society colleagues, Arup uh, and the Department of Transport joined us as well to have a really good, well-rounded conversation about some of the key topics that we are working on. Um, and the event really brought together many eg specialists and operational leads as well. And we were looking at some specific areas, particularly around social value and increasing socioeconomic inclusion, and also about increasing the representative workforce and building inclusive cultures and the talent and skills shortages that we will we currently see now and we certainly will see going forward. And what does the next generation of transport professionals look like and how can we ensure that that is as diverse as possible? Um, I'm going to keep talking because uh, I, I just wonder if I could perhaps just put a shout out to, um, oh, wonderful, I think we might be able to get, sorry, apologies for the problems we're having with the tech here. Um, that will do um, and hopefully we can um, get some information up to you. Let me first of all talk about the importance of uh, inclusion for those of you who might be quite still relatively new to the conversations we have about equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, and what we're hoping to do, if we go to slide three there, Neil, is what's really important is that we don't forget the business case when it comes to inclusion. And so I'll just read some of the, you've probably seen some of these areas before, but it's very important to remember when we're talking about really important issues like the bottom line, that it's absolutely proven that organisations with inclusive cultures perform better. And there's some stats there to show you that they are two times as likely to meet or exceed financial targets. They're three times as likely to be high performing. They're six times as likely to be innovative and agile. And they're twice as likely to achieve better outcomes than those who do not have inclusive cultures. And at ACOM, we came very much alive to this piece, uh, particularly to be fair, following the activity last year with Black Lives Matter. I think it showed a real showcase on uh, eg and where we hadn't been thinking about it in as much depth as perhaps we should have been doing. And I think many organisations were the same in terms of that. And we need to start delivering on our ideas on eg and because there's a lot of talking where eg and is concerned. What is very important is that we talk about our delivery as well. So on the next slide, um, we this is the framework we used to um, assess where we were. We held the mirror up to us at ACOM to have a really good think about where were, were we really when it came to eg and I. And I thought it might be quite useful to use the same model. This was from our colleagues at Brooke Graham who supported us with our work. Where you think transport planning is as an industry, and it, I, I'd be really interested to see uh, your comments in the chat in particular about this, um, where uh, the different stages right through from ignore, where diversity inclusion is not a priority for the organisation, right through to sustained where it's absolutely hard coded into your business as usual activity. I think it's fair to say, and I've been in this field now for over 10 years, there are very few organisations that are at sustained. You might be able to keep it for a short while, but it absolutely needs to tenacity to keep it going. And we felt that at ACOM we were at a tactical where we were considering DNI, but it was quite ad hoc and it wasn't particularly uh, joined up. Uh, and um, it was quite discreet, so it wasn't uh, it wasn't particularly open in terms of the activity that was happening. And already the work that I've done, particularly with my colleagues at ACOM uh, since around five months ago, is to make sure we start delivering in a more strategic place. So we have launched our new strategy and we have a whole new robust governance structure as well to uh, make sure we deliver on this. 
And so again, I'd just like to ask you, where do you think transport planning is as an industry itself? So when you think of your own organisations and then apply that wider to the industry, where do you think it is? Uh, and we, th that needs to be an honest reply because this will not work if we are not, we will not bring about the culture change we want to see if we're not honest at the start about what some of our challenges are. And what I've been really pleased since joining ACOM and throughout any contacts I've had throughout the industry, and there's been many already, is the openness and transparency of our industry to accept we are as good as we could be and that there's a lot more work to do and that we're absolutely committed to bringing about this change as well. And that's what the round table was for. So if we go to the next slide, please, Neil, it will just give you uh, basically our agenda um, showing you what we covered at the round table. Um, we actually gave um, some provocations before our guests arrived. And what was really uh, helpful and I particularly enjoyment, enjoyed this piece of our round table is we got our own graduates to present those questions themselves with a particular case study. It immediately brought diversity of thought into the room. It re it, certainly from a whole different remit, whichever diversity lens you look, want to look for. But obviously, particularly from a generational point of view, we have, um, for the first time, several generations working alongside each other with very different ideas. Uh, and I would tap into, the, you know, if there's a lesson learned, absolutely tap into your graduate experience because they often know the challenges themselves and have some fantastic innovative ideas how to solve them. And we asked our guests the following questions and had a real good discussions about this. And they were, what's the biggest people and social value issue facing transport planning? We also then dived into the issue of data, in particular bias around planning and planning decisions and what role does improved capability play here? And then finally, what role does transport planning play in improving social mobility and social inclusion? And my challenge as the chair I hosted, and I have absolute empathy for Mark today and his role. My challenge wasn't trying to get the conversation going. My challenge was actually trying to somehow, in the nicest way, control it because we could have, we had a session, if it was about two hours long, the richness, the insight, the uh, engagement and the commitment into the conversation was so much, it was actually quite a struggle to keep to time. Uh, and we had some uh, great pieces there. But also from the outset, we absolutely made it clear that this was about action and commitment. And we asked the questions in advance about how can we work together collaboratively? And if the industry could do one thing this year to solve these issues, what would it be? And what I'm going to do now is hand over to Neil, who can introduce himself, but also then tell you about the uh, many of the themes that came out of our discussion as well. I'll hand over to you now, Neil. I think you might be on mute, Neil. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> My name's Neil McDonald. I'm a transport planner and regional director with AECOM. Um, I've been in the industry 20, 20 years now and still sort of trying to get my head around PowerPoint and Zoom and all those things. But I think I think we're there now and hopefully people can see the screen. So, yeah, I'm, I just wanted to spend a few minutes really drawing together some of the, the, the sort of threads and themes that came out of that debate. And I think, as Rachel said, it, it, it was a really lively discussion with lots of different dimensions and ideas and, and, and thinking coming through. But, you know, fund, fundamentally, why is social value and EDI, EDI critical to what we do as, as, as transport planners? Well, it's all of these things, really. You know, the, it, communities expect it. They want to see the impact of infrastructure and transport proposals that we put forward. Um Ultimately, equality and diversity is a key fundamental building block to achieving long-term sustainability. So, you know, COP, COP's been a major part of the agenda of late. And, and actually, if we can get um, social equality um, sorted, that in part will help to address some of the wider environmental issues that we face. Um, and, and fundamentally, you know, as an industry and, and in organisations within that industry, it's really important that we have as many of those voices um, and lived experiences manifested within the work that, that we do as possible. So as employers, it's really important that we do get a diverse um, resource pool to draw ideas and, and thinking upon. But aside of all of these things, it's just the right thing to do. 
Um, I don't know about others. I joined transport planning in part by accident, but once I'd made it into transport planning, it was quite clear to me that what I wanted to do was make people's lives easier. Um, and and I think hopefully I'm, I'm sharing a, a call here with people that are similarly like like minded. Um, and ultimately, we want to make people's lives easier. We want to make their out you know the outcomes of those lives more fulfilling. And give them give everybody an equal um, opportunity to engage in in, in opportunities um, in all aspects of life. Um, oh, can we believe that? My uh, slide deck is locked up. I'm going to stop sharing. We'll share again. I think we're going to do bingo on the technology, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> oh, really soon. Me. Right. Does that come up again now? Can people see? Oh, we can. Now? We can. Yeah, we can oh. see that now. Yeah. Still locked up. <laughs> right. I'm going to have to. Uh... Mark, I I wonder if uh, I think we should send you our slides, and I I wonder if any of your team might have a copy that we can. I don't know if it's problems just our end. There okay, go. I've got it moving again now. Let me just see if that works. Let's give one more time for Mill. If not, we'll uh, we'll switch to yeah. our yeah. Okay. No. Uh, just... Rogan, do you have uh, Rachel? Oh yeah, I'm good. No, you... <laughs> there we go. Got him there again. Oh, slick. Um, right. So, what did we learn as part of that debate? I mean, I, we we could sit here for two or three hours talking about all the different elements that we talked about. Um, but the, bo the you know the bottom line is here: communities have got a really valuable role in forming strategic decision making in the work that we actually do. You know, they're the people with the real, true lived experiences. Um, that can really make a difference in the outcomes of any form of transport solution we put forward as professionals. Um, and therefore, it's absolutely vital that they're involved from day one of that, that process, from the point at which a scheme lands on the, to the table to the point at which it's delivered and subsequently evaluated and monitored afterwards so we learn the lessons about what works well and what doesn't. It's those individuals within those communities that perhaps have the experience of riding a bike in the... Um, you know, in the pouring rain or along a busy main busy main road. It's those communities and individuals that maybe have had to do their weekly shopping, you know, on, on, a, on a bus and experience the, 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 the traumas and difficulties that can bring. It's those individuals that either may be, you know, culturally excluded or um, from a, even from a disability point of view, disadvantaged in the way that we design and build infrastructure. So it's vital they're involved right from day one to make sure we get the most out of the infrastructure we we build and plan for. Um, sec secondly, transport and um, transport infrastructure is there to do a job. It's there to support the communities, the functionality of the land use around it. Um, and naturally, we need to make sure that whatever we're doing doesn't just look at transport planning as a bus scheme or a road scheme or a rail project, but actually what utility is it bringing to the communities of which it serves. And some of those are obvious and some of them are less obvious. And that's why it's really important we get the less obvious um, situations brought into our thought process. And again, a diverse labour force and workforce within the consultancy and the public sector market enables us to reflect all those all those those views. Um, I think you know ultimately value for money is a big question for all decision makers, and quite often a decision to proceed with a project or not comes down to value for money and what return it brings. I think we you know we had a fair bit of discussion around recent changes in green book guidance from Treasury, which is really really encouraging in that greater emphasis is being placed on the strategic case and narrative, um, which puts us in good stead for the good stead for the future. Um, but fundamentally, that will only work if we can get our ourselves and decision makers away from just assessing the merits of transport schemes on traditional metrics like journey, journey time savings, for example, and moving more into equality um, and social impact 
outcomes. And then finally, um, yeah, basically as a, as, as a, as a business to bring those, all those lessons learned in, we need to be recruiting and retaining those staff to represent the communities, which we, which, which we ultimately serve and bring in those um, ideas to the table. So just other lessons, I'm, I'm really going to sort of major on one really, which was around data bias. And there was a lot of discussion. We had a number of techie people who do a lot of work with numbers and interpretation of numbers. But, but I think, you know, that drew out to me an interesting theme around the idea that quite often we, we, we have some really strong, powerful data, but perhaps we've got um, a conscious or unconscious biases as to how we actually use that information just by way of example traffic modeling for example when we do when we're when we're modeling modeling transport projects you know whether that's just a simple highway model or something that's maybe a little bit more multimodal in nature um we, we perhaps have certain biases about the way things work so you know we might for example assume if a new bus uh, if, if a new scheme is scheme is going in that somebody that just makes that immediate choice from getting from their car onto a bus service when actually that bus service might not be available at the right time. It might not be um, physically accessible, affordable, and all those kind of other what culturally, you know, there might be reasons why that alternative mode of transport is not available. So we can't just look at a number in a spreadsheet and go, well, that goes from there to there because the journey time's quicker. People don't work in, in that way. Um, you know, we exclusively focus on what, when we when we're looking at wealthy areas, we naturally assume that the car is the is the is the mode of choice, and that actually there's no accessibility problems in those areas. But actually, even in your wealthiest areas, you you have areas of social deprivation and social need, whether that's on a yeah on a on a sort of income basis or whether it's really to do with the the, the social demographic that you sit in, um, and then. Uh, blah, 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 what was the one I was going to mention? Yeah, there's just that natural assumption. We always think somebody, you know, wants to travel by car. They want to buy a car. Well, actually, that's not always the case. People are quite happy to use public transport if the good op the good alternative is 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 there. So, um, you know, there's lots of lots of ways in which we just make default assumptions. And again, by having that diversity of workforce, technical specialists. We really start to test some uncomfortable ideas and thinking, um, and that's you know where I'd like to see the industry going. Is, is you know we respond to that green book autonomy in a way, and actually start looking at more of these wider impacts. And I think we've, we've started on that journey, but there's a there's a heck of a lot more to do. And once we've then achieved that, that's when we'll start to really see some pro some proper impact on social mobility within the industry itself but fundamentally within the communities that we serve. So a few, few bits of food for thought there, but um, I'll just hand over to Rachel just to, uh, to, to wrap up in terms of what, what, what we think needs to happen next. Thank you, Neil. Really appreciate that. And a really good summary of many of the key issues we discussed. In the time we've got today, unfortunately, we can't go into the level of detail that would probably do it justice, but uh, it hopefully gave you a real overview. And then the, the question is, if you remember at the start, whilst we uh, spoke about the discussions, we also had a real call to action at the end about what are we actually going to do about this? And this is then going to be our call to action from you as a society now today. Uh, so what do we need? Where do we need to go next? You know, many of us have been wrangling with areas of uh, equity, diversity, inclusion for a long time now. And the dial isn't shifting both within our industry and wider. So we need to the time is now to really start focusing on certain areas and do that in a collaborative way rather than separate industries trying to make their own and sorry, separate organisations trying to make their own impact. And some of the key recommendations that came out of the roundtable were strengthen industry codes of conduct. There was a particular ask there for around community engagement and what is the best way and what is the right time to start um, uh, engaging with communities. There wasn't a, a one size fits all answer to that, but something about um, strengthening wider codes of conduct, but with a particular focus on guidance on that as well. 
we've touched on several times now about um, having a diverse workforce, particularly from a social mobility point of view. And this idea that you can't just recruit your way out of it. New entry points like the uh, apprenticeships are helpful, but you can recruit as much difference as you like, but you need to make sure you're able to keep those people as well. And that's by bringing an inclusive culture where people feel they belong. We spoke about integrated use of perspectives and how to get their real perspectives rather than what you think their perspective is. And that links into that piece about addressing data biases as well. So that's our call to action for you now. And to think we can have a wider discussion either in the Q&A or throughout today about how we could start to tackle some of that. I'd just like to put a few thank yous out before we finish. Thank you to Neil for getting me out of the tech hole today. That was particularly helpful. But particularly thank you to all the people who contributed to our discussion. Um, we had a really rich discussion uh, and it wouldn't be successful if it wasn't for your input. So thank you for engagement and commitment and uh, look forward to seeing what we deliver on this. Thank you for that, Mark. Lovely. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Neil, particularly given the uh, the tech issues there. Um, and I was, it was great. And uh, I've only ever heard, I've only heard positive feedback from from the roundtable. But it seemed like it really shone a light on a number of these uh, these issues that, as you say, Neil, can be quite uncomfortable. I mean, this point about data, I think, is 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 key, and it's actually something that I know that uh, a number of other speakers today will pick up on, including Victoria, and also this afternoon with the Jacobs team doing a lot of work around, in particular, around gender. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really good. And Neil, I, I, mean, I thought it was interesting you mentioned the issue of appraisal because appraisal is ultimately what, what uh, gets the, the funding to address some of these issues. And I think the opening up of appraisal to include this issue around well-being uh, is really exciting because I think that does give us a you know, potential in to in increase the amount of priority we give to projects that actually address some of these issues, as opposed to dealing with some of those problems that maybe only favour a particular subset of society, such, such as people who commute in the peak. Um, which is uh, you know not not necessarily the, uh, the the full spectrum of the people that we, that we serve as a sector. Um, so that's great. We're running a little bit behind, not helped by my little um, my little speech there. So I will go go straight into our next speaker if I can. So uh, Nina, if I can ask you to introduce yourself and uh, go into your speech, please. Thanks, Mark. Hi everyone, and happy Transport Planning Day. Um, so I'm Nina Kwaji, and I'm an associate in Arab's Transport Planning Team, based in the London office. Um, my background is in civil engineering, but I actually um, specialised in transport engineering stroke planning, which is what I've been doing for the past 21 years, and I've been with Arab a little over 16 years. So with the theme of this year's Transport Planning Day in mind. Today, I'll be presenting on two initiatives that Arab has recently embarked on with the aim of becoming a more inclusive, diverse and equitable organization that delivers better outcomes for all. Next slide, please. So what are the two plans? So we've got our work on bound strategy, which you may have heard about in the news. And we also have our UK region race plan. Next slide, please. So what's work on bound? Um, so earlier this year, Arab announced that they were introducing um, a hybrid way of working that would essentially give its UK employees the flexibility to decide how and where they choose to work. And the aim of that really was to create a working environment that accommodates the different needs of both the business and the staff and how the two need, well, and how the two can work side by side. Um, so what does it entail? Um, rather than working your traditional Monday to Fridays, 9 a.m. to 5.30 type um, hours or pattern, the idea is that employees will be able to work flexibly across the whole week. So seven days a week from Monday to Sunday, and they'll be able to choose also their, their hours of working. Um, and in addition, um, remote working has become a permanent option. So um, apart from having to work two days from any Arab office in the UK, the other three days of the week, you're essentially free to work from wherever you want to. Next slide, please. 
So how did this come about? Um, so long before COVID, um, back in 2019, um, in April to July of 2019, um, we undertook a pilot study at our Liverpool office, and that gave us some really useful insights um, into, into all of this. Um, and that's what we've essentially used to develop Work Unbound. And um, in terms of what that showed, um, it showed that quite a significant proportion of staff really embrace flexibility. As you can see from the stats there, 82 flex their hours of work and also um, their days of working. As you can see, about 35% chose to work on a weekend. Um, also, um, there was quite, um, an increased proportion of staff that felt that they had the flexibility to manage uh, both their work and non-work commitments. Um, also, remote working was really embraced. So you've got 55% um, who chose to work remotely um, at some point during the trial compared to 33% before. So quite a difference there. Um, and what was also quite interesting was that um, employees reported that they felt leaders were actually, you know, leading by example in terms of flexible working. Having said all of that, the office still played a key um, role in that about 56% of staff still decided to use the office five days a week during the trial period. Next slide, please. So what were some of the benefits that came out of this? So first of all, employee productivity greatly improved. Um, employees also reported that they felt they had more of a work-life balance and their well-being increased. Um, the fact that employees also didn't have to travel in five days a week into the office meant that, you know, that would really help the firm in achieving its net zero emissions targets. And um, just lastly, it's just, it just makes us that much more competitive, especially for prospective new staff. And um, on that point, I was just going to share something um, from my personal life. When I joined um, 16 years ago, um, soon after I had my children, um, my first child arrived 14 years ago. Another time when I asked um, to work flexibly and also to work from home, which many companies weren't granting, I was given that flexibility at Arup. And I must say all the support and um, all the flexibility that, you know, I have been given by the company, um, you know, throughout these years has just been phenomenal. And I suppose it's a testament to my longevity um, at Arup, really. Um, so I just thought I would share that. Um, OK, next slide, please. So how are different people within Arup utilizing Work Unbound? So we've got um, one of my colleagues, Steve Fernandez, he uses it to exercise. And that's something that greatly um, helps with his well-being and his productivity. We've got Priyanka, who uses it for a side hustle. And I know um, it might probably be a bit controversial to some people saying, oh, you know, like she's, she's using it as a side business rather than focusing on Arab um, Arab's business. But I, I suppose the point here is if we want to be truly inclusive, then, you know, whether if Priyanka, if, if that's what makes Priyanka tick, if that's what, you know, improves her well being, then why not? For as long as it doesn't impact her, um, her work commitments and her delivery at work, you know, I don't see why not. Um, and then you've got Samantha who uses this for, you know, childcare. She's got her four and five year olds. Um, and I must say these snippets are actually from a Financial Times article, which was done on Work Unbound. It was published last month. Um, I think the link was at the bottom. Um, anyway, for those that want to maybe go check it out, um, it's got some really useful info. Next slide, please. So now moving on to our region, race and ethnicity plan. Um, and I was just going to give you a bit of a background on that one. Um, so in the wake of um, global protests that occurred last year, following the killing of George Floyd, as well as other race related issues that have occurred in recent years, Arab um, went about doing some soul searching in order to tackle race inequality head on. 
Um, so as a result, the UK race um, plan came about, and this is a three-year plan which um, sets out what the firm will do to increase the representation of Black, Asian and minority ethnic staff at every level of the firm. Um, become more inclusive for BAME people and also move towards zero tolerance of racist behavior at the workplace. Next slide, please. Um, so what does that entail? As I said, it's a three-year plan and it's based on the following inclusion commitments, leadership, thriving, clarity and candor, future talent and measurement. And I was just going to touch on each of these ones in turn. So future leadership, sorry, leadership essentially is... Um, having a leadership that is diverse and reflects and understands the communities we serve and also celebrates difference. Thriving is essentially creating an environment where people will thrive and will progress. Clarity and condor is the, um, the firm being very clear on what is good behavior and again, making it very clear that discrimination of, in, of any kind will not be tolerated. Um, and then you've got future talent, which is the firm making a commitment to attract, recruit and retain the best people from a diverse pool as much as reasonably possible. Um, and then div um, measurement, which is developing an approach to measuring and reporting on diversity, including racial diversity. Um, and the way the plan works is that against each of these commitments, there are actions that have been set against them, which will be used to measure um, the plan in terms of progress. Next slide, please. So um, what's the status of these plans? Um, as I said, um, they're both very recent initiatives. They're both very much at their infancy. So we don't have all of the answers to all of the questions as yet, but we're hoping in time, um, you know, as we review and we monitor how things, you know, um, evolve or how things progress, that will give us a deeper understanding of some of the issues that um, crop up um, to enable, enable us to refine um, these plans. And ultimately, the plan is to make us a truly diverse, inclusive and equitable organization that delivers better outcomes for our clients, for ourselves, for society as a whole, by the wider expertise, skills, great ideas, and, in, and innovation that only a diverse workforce brings to the table. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Um, I mean, I think they're just sort of talking about uh, rising to the challenges that were identified in, in, in the first presentation uh, about how we build that diverse workforce that can actually respond to some of these challenges. Um, that, that's got to be the best way, I think, of uh, understanding different perspectives is to have that uh, ability to, to have, bring all these different people to the table from, from, from the off. Um, one, one thing I did see, and it was actually flashed up in your in your news article there, was uh, Work Unbound has a sort of positive side, but then it also has that slight concern about not being able to switch off. And is that something that, that you've experienced or, or, or is it something that's manageable within the, the, the framework of this, the programme? Um, I think, yeah, it, it is something that it does need discipline. Um, but then again, there are there is support within, you know, the organization, you know, I, for instance, I've got my line manager. So if she, for instance, sees that I am sending an email out at all times or, you know, yeah, it's the sort of stuff that, you know, will get flagged up and say, oh, I noticed you were online, you know, at this time or whatever, unless you've got a prior arrangement that these are your working hours. If it's outside of that, I think there are people that are looking out for your well-being and will probably ask you, you know, you know, is there anything we can do? Is there anything we can support you with? And but I, I do agree. It does take discipline. Mm. And so it's another management yeah. tool that you've got to learn, I guess. To, to, to yeah. Base. Yeah, it's really good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we'll move on to our last speaker today. And actually, I'm going to go straight to, to Joe Ward, uh, TPS uh, Director and Board Member to introduce uh, our Bursarian of the Year. 
Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Happy Transport Planning Day. Um, my name is Jo Ward. I'm a TPS board director with responsibility for organising the annual bursary competition. The annual bursary competition encourages young professional members of the TPS to produce a piece of structured thought on a topic of current relevance to transport planning and supported by a mentor. The bursaries provide a great opportunity for expansion of knowledge on a topic that's relevant to the profession, but that you might not get to the chance to work on within your everyday work. Participation in the competition, especially winning the Bursary of the Year Award, has helped previous bursarians to attract the interest of their employer, maybe gain promotion and even get invited to chair a conference session or two. In 2020, the competition focused on a topic particularly close to my heart, a transport system that is accessible for everyone. How do we make this happen? The competition attracted the highest number of applicants to date, indicating what an important topic this is for all of us working within the built environment. The judges spent a lovely afternoon in January listening to the six finalists present their papers, and they, along with the board, were delighted to award all six finalists £500 for their work. You can read all of the papers in full on the Transport Planning Society webpage, so please take a look. Further, we were delighted to award Victoria Hild of WSP an overall winner of the Transport Planning Society Bursary Competition of the Year Award for 2020 and a further £250. Victoria, I'm delighted to be introducing you as the next speaker this afternoon. Thanks, Jay. Just double checking, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yep, perfect. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, let's go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about unconscious bias in transport planning, which, um, as Joe said, was um, something that I was able to take a sort of a deep dive look into. Um, and uh, yeah, here I'm going to tell you a bit more about that. So I think a good place to start, uh, next slide please, is what is unconscious bias? Uh, so just in case anyone hasn't heard about what this is. Um, it's the non-conscious opinions or views of a person shaped by a range of different factors, which includes background, culture, situational context, and prior experiences. Now, unconscious bias can involuntarily influence a person's actions and decision-making, which as transport planners, we are making decisions every day that are impacting transport users. And so next slide, please. I've got relevance to transport planning. Um, so looking into this sort of topic area, there wasn't a lot of research out there that sort of, um, I'll say in-depth research, but initial research had actually found that um, bias is pervasive in transport planning. Um, now, this isn't a very good thing. It can lead to the creation of barriers to transport. Um, so this is not only people experiencing um, barriers to traveling um, whilst on the transport network, so um, train station or bus station, but it's actually stopping people from um, using different transport systems in the first place. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so my approach to the bursary research, I wanted to understand a bit more about the impacts of that unconscious bias has on transport planners work. Uh, so if you go on to the next slides, uh, you'll be able to see sort of a two pond approach that I took. I wanted to speak to transport planners um, just to kind of uh, understand uh, their views on unconscious bias and how it impacts their work and also um, different opinions on uh, transport accessibility. I uh, designed a survey which was uh, sent out to over 180 organisations. Um, people could complete it online via the telephone or um, via post, just to make it as accessible as possible. And um, all in all, I got over 160 responses. And then to sort of complement this, I wanted to speak to the people actually using the transport that we're designing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, took, I took this research during the um, second lockdown in England, so I wasn't able to go out and speak to people. Uh, so instead, I uh, contacted different uh, sort of transport inequality organisations, uh, and I spoke with um, eight different representatives from them uh, just to understand um, sort of their thoughts and opinions and um, to try and get feedback uh, from sort of uh, transport customers that they were working with. Next slide, please. So findings. Um, 
I'm going to run through some headline findings and then speak about some different measures that have come out from the research. Uh, in total, there's seven different measures. I unfortunately don't have time to talk through them all today. Um, so I've just kind of uh, picked out a handful, uh, which I thought people would find interesting. Uh, so if we go on to the next slide, thanks. Um, so the headline findings were almost everyone that I spoke to um, in transport planning uh, agreed that transport should be accessible to all users, uh, which I'd say is a positive start. Um, and then the second number I've got on there, uh, so almost a third of transport planners that I spoke to experienced uh, barriers to accessing transport at least once a week. Now, this number might seem quite high, but if you compare it to a European Commission study, um, it actually found that 75% of transport users experience barriers to transport at least once a week. So we've got this huge gap of uh, the experiences of transport planners who are designing transport systems and the actual people that are using these transport systems, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, so I'm just going to run through a couple of measures uh, that have come out as a result of these findings. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the first one is to use your awareness of unconscious bias to take accountability and think outside of your bubble. 93% uh, of people that I spoke to knew what unconscious bias was um, and only 1% were unaware. I think it's really important that um, we should use this awareness um, sort of in our everyday role um, to take steps to avoid designing transport that doesn't take account the needs of everyone using it or attempting to use it. Um, this follows nicely into the next slide, um, which is another measure. So it's reconsider the delivery of unconscious bias training. Uh, so this kind of feeds into Rachel and um, Neil's uh, talk earlier, the Quality and Human Rights Commission have actually did a sort of deep dive into all the different types of unconscious bias training out there. And they found that the um, sort of type of training that is usually given, it's um, usually very generalised and is, um, say, like a webinar where you're just clicking through to the next screen. It's not very interactive. And they actually found that um, that sort of training doesn't really do anything. Um, if anything, it's it's not helping sort of reduce the impacts of unconscious bias. Um, so, um, you know, as Rachel said earlier, well, what's the point of doing something if it's not working? Um, so this is sort of a measure for organisations to just kind of think about, you know, is the training we're delivering, is this really sort of inclusive? Is it helping um, our transport planners um, to overcome their biases? And then next slide, please. And then the final one I'm going to talk about today is um, deliver etiquette and accessibility focused experience sessions. Uh, so when I was speaking to transport planners, um, I found that 34% um, considered the needs of people with protected characteristics less than once per week in their role. And 8% had actually never considered the needs of um, people with protected characteristics. Um, so here again, we have this gap um, of transport planners having these biases unconsciously um, and then not thinking about the whole spectrum of people that are attempting to use our transport systems. Um, so again, this is another one for organisations to um, kind of think. I know um, people like TfL and Blackpool bus operators actually um, do deliver sort of accessibility focused sessions um, for their employees and uh, the feedback that I've got from that is it's, um, it's time consuming uh, but it is definitely worth doing. Um, so next slide, uh, reflection. Um, so Joe asked me to um, think about what had happened um, since looking into this research and then sort of look forward. Uh, so we've gone to the next slide. I think looking back at, I know it's not done yet, but 2021 so far, um, I do think speaking to sort of colleagues and other people in the industry, there is a greater awareness of the impacts of bias. Um, lots of bubble bursting there. 
and, and there does appear to be more EDI conversations with not just the usual people, you know, more and more people are sort of, um, you know, coming into this and maybe people feel on this webinar uh, that hadn't thought about it before or thinking about it a bit more. Uh, but has enough action been taken? I'm not too sure. Um, but if we go on to the next slide, sort of looking forwards, I do think there are opportunities. Um, so just in 2022, we've got the publication of the new local transport plan guidance. Um, whilst it's mostly touted to be concentrating on sort of transport decarbonisation, it is going to um, sort of take a wider look at accessibility and how we can um, get more people using different types of transport. Um, sort of linked to that next point there is kind of a need to investment in transport. Um, you know, more money better schemes. And then uh, finally, we've got the publication of the uh, TPS EDI Roundtable Report, um, which should make for some really good reading. And I'm sure uh, TPS will act on the actions going forward. So yeah, thank you for having me and uh, thanks for listening. Lovely. Thank you very much, Victoria, and uh, well done for overcoming those uh, pernicious, uh, pernicious uh, te technological <laughs> okay. issues you have there. Um, okay, great. So we've got a few minutes just to take um, questions. Um, uh, there's one here that's uh, that's come in about specifically, uh, I think a colleague actually is maybe, maybe calling in from South Africa, I think, based on the comment in the chat, about how the planning biases have impacted um, career choices and accesses to health and other social services um, uh, yeah, through, through the provision of transport in infrastructure and uh, so, uh, and, and, and services and products. And Victoria, that, that just sort of went straight to your last slide there, I think, about the LTP guidance next year and how we might need to head back to that conversation about accessibility. Accessibility both in terms of physical accessibility for those with mobility impairments, um, but also just accessibility in terms of access to services. Is that, are you hoping to see a big focus of that in that LTP guidance? Oh, you're on mute at the moment. Oh dear, there's always one, isn't there? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, I think um, obviously decarbonisation will be sort of the, the main um, look through, but um, I think it's going to be a really good opportunity to sort of take a step back and um, think about accessibility a bit more. Um, obviously, you know, it starts with policy and then that comes through um, to sort of creating better, more accessible transport systems. Um, so yeah, looking forward to seeing, seeing what it goes. Um, I also just popped in the chat the challenges that um, the ACOM roundtable had identified, and I, I kind of opened up to any of the panelists and indeed attendees of today's event. To see, is there anything missing in there? And are if we were to do particularly well against those challenges, would we move from tactical to uh, sustained, or do you think there's other things that need to happen to get us on that journey? Any reflections from any of our panelists? I can come in there, Mark, if you want to. Um, I think that's a big question. And um, I think the challenge, we, I don't know whether it's something that's missing. I'm sure there is. But I think one of the challenges, actually, is we try and do too much where EGI is concerned and don't focus on specific areas. And I think we are better off doing through, as an industry. And that's the next challenge. How do we do that in collaboration? Three things well than 20 things not so well, because these things take so much time to actually come through and see the bottom line change. So for example, work that we might want to do from a social value point of view, and particularly schools, that's a really good example. We might not see the results of that for another five, 10 years to come. So I think the one thing we need to do is as an industry, is being this for the long haul. And I think our industry is particularly well suited for that because many of our projects are long-term projects, whereas in other organisations, you literally change from year to year in terms of your focus areas. When we think of some of the transport planning projects, they'll be years in the making. So actually, if we build that in from the very outset, we might be able to measure that data and because that's another big thing I think we should focus on as well mm. um over the lifetime of that project cycle mm. 
Um, I mean, and, and Neil, if I can bring you in here, and there's a, just to link it to a question that's just come up from from, from Nina Smith. Um, yeah, how, how how do we get transport planners to pay perhaps as, as much attention to pavements and cycle lanes as uh, sometimes we people feel they spend on their, on carriageway whips? Is it about if we race to those challenges, will will will, will that be an inevitable outcome for that, or is that something more we have to do? I think no doubt the policy agenda has a strong bearing on where where transport solutions lie and what transport solutions get prioritised a lot of the time. And certainly with cycling and, and, and walking infrastructure at the minute, that's a, a, hot, a hot topic and there's a lot, a lots of investment going into that space. So I think at this particular point in time, we've got a real opportunity to strengthen our understanding of the wider benefits that that, that sort of investment investment brings you know and, and i did very fleetingly mention the words monitoring and evaluation in my in my speech earlier on and we really need to get to grips with what impacts these schemes are actually delivering it's not just about forecasting what we think will happen but what are the what what are the material benefits i think also there is still a mindset and decision making around and it's a transitional period I think we're going through. I think people do get that we can't keep doing what we've always done and prioritising schemes on, you know, the, the number of minutes or hours it saves in journey time. So I think that is highly recognised now going forward. So I think we are seeing a shift. There was one example I did want to sort of bring out in some work that we were doing with, with um, TFWM, which, which said it to me in terms of the appraisal end of the spectrum. If you take a whole network across the city, for example, and said, right, where do you invest your money going into, into the future? Nine times out of 10, there's a tendency to go, well, we'll actually look at where the infrastructure is needed around a particular employment site or around a particular um, prospective housing development site or wherever it might be, or a strong commuting route. And you, you, that, that, that's fairly standard. But where we went with the TFWM work, working around the KRN, was actually looking at it on, on its head and saying, actually, as a local transport plan, you could already identify all of those areas that are congestion hotspots or future employment growth areas. But actually, what about these communities that have been left behind, the ones that haven't had investment year after year after year? And actually, that's where, in some ways, walking and cycling infrastructure particularly can really really help those communities in providing them access and connections into um into other modes of transport and further opportunities yeah so, yeah sorry nina you got your hand up there yeah i was yeah. going to pass on to nina to, for a <laughs> final word oh okay um yeah and i was just going to say that um in the chat i've seen johnston has made a very good point um i'm a development planner, um, I work in development planning, and I think we all have um, a responsibility, really, when I'm designing, say, a cycle lane, for instance, at the back of my mind, I'm asking myself the question, you know, would I be comfortable, my 14-year-old or 10-year-old nephew or niece using it? If I'm not comfortable, then surely I shouldn't be promoting that. So we all have a responsibility to make sure we are designing to the right things. Yeah. And, and sorry, just to finish on that point there then. So I think one of the, one about, I totally get your point about young children because I've got them myself. And this is where we've got to give confidence to our children in using these alternative modes. So if we can teach our children that they can walk and cycle by doing it with them, and showing where is safe to cycle, perhaps where they shouldn't be cycling, by way of example, we can start to teach them positive behaviours around those modes. But if we just tell our children that it's dangerous and we're not comfortable with them going on a bike, well, where's the incentive in the future for them to cycle? And as a planner, it would be great if you can design all these issues out. So. There we are, the gauntlets thrown down. I know there's many people in the chat that will definitely uh, respond to that sentiment. And um, I, I, we're almost coming to the end, but there was one point I wanted to bring you back in on, Nina, if, that, if it's okay. So one of the challenges was around apprenticeships, recruitment and retention. And that was very much kind of the focus of your um, your, your, your speech there about how Arup is trying to remove any barriers really for, for different groups. And that specific issue of apprenticeships, is that something that you see that holds great promise in, 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 in sort of levelling up our workforce and having a more diverse workforce? 
Yeah, so over the years, I mean, uh, my team in particular, um, we have been making a concerted effort to recruit from the diverse, um, from a diverse pool. So in that regard, HR is working with um, agencies that, you know, look at um, people from BAME backgrounds, working with universities, schools, and that kind of thing, in order to have that diverse pool, so to speak, that hopefully we'll be able to recruit from. And in that regard, yeah, we've got apprentices that are quite diverse within, within my team. You're on mute, Mark. Oh, I thought I'd get for it. Um, it'd been very interesting reflecting on Transport Planning Society's own work on the Transport Planning Apprenticeship degree, where you're really removing many of the barriers that might stop certain uh, demographic groups, particularly socioeconomic groups, being able to access and get into a career in transport planning, because you're not having to pay uh, tuition fees, you're actually getting paid to work and then attend and, uh, and get that degree. And that seems to me to be a really fruitful area for further exploration. Um, OK, we are slightly over, so I will bring the uh, session to a close. So I want to end by thanking the speakers for giving up the time uh, and the fantastic contributions, Rachel, uh, Neil, Nina and Victoria. Um, I'd like to thank the sponsors for making it happen. Uh, Brogan and PTRC, who's uh, been the stalwart, um, uh, really called on in at some length today to help out with the technical issues. Um, I'd like to um, thank the JFG communications team who have been giving us uh, professional support on Transport Planning Day throughout. Uh, and of course, I'd like to thank our attendees and indeed our membership, uh, because without you, it would, wouldn't be a lot of point in doing it and uh, we wouldn't be able to anyhow. Uh, you can continue the conversation by using the hashtag TPDay21 uh, hashtag. Uh, and on Twitter and on, on, on LinkedIn. Um, and as mentioned at the top, this was our first session of TP Day. Uh, our next session will take place in 28 minutes now, uh, where we'll hear from the DFT's uh, Emma Ward, um, uh, director there uh, on the work that they're doing around inclusion and accessibility, and also from the team at Jacobs looking specifically at the issue of uh, gender. And I hope to see as many as possible uh, of you there uh, in half an hour or 27 minutes. So I'll draw this session to a close and uh, thank again, everybody. Thank you, Rogan.